what an appropriate song to, to uh, kind of begin my time, just because we're speaking about finding joy uh, today, uh, and I want to share with you from the book of Philippians over the next several weeks about how we can find joy. So, um, many of you I've met for the first time today, or this weekend with yesterday as well, and understand some were out of town and maybe in town, and so I don't want to rehash my story fully um, from the last time I shared, but I do want to share just a moment because joy has been integral in my life over the past year. Uh, it may be hard to realize that if you know what I've gone through, uh, but what I've gone through is not unique to me. We all go through difficult times. But for us, it's been a season, a year of, of, of intense pain and, and, and sorrow. I lost my granny a year ago, uh, my dad, in November to a year-long battle with cancer, and then my granddad, uh, January 1st. So it's been tough. But through it all, the Lord has given me joy. And that may sound bizarre to you, uh, but I bet if you've gone through difficult times as well, somehow leaning on the Lord has brought you joy as well. Joy unspeakable, joy un, uh, unintelligible. It doesn't make sense at times. And perhaps you're here today and that sounds foreign to you because... You may not have a relationship with Jesus. Maybe someone's invited you. I hope that I can help you see how joy can be found in the midst of struggle so that we can, at the end of it, say, it is well with me. It is well with my soul that, that the Lord is our strength and our, and our, and our, and our stay. And ultimately, uh, I came to find this passage of scripture, these, this book of Philippians, not even knowing what I was about to face. It was about um, a, just a few months before some of these difficulties began to take place in my life, and I was studying and uh, teaching through Philippians uh, and finding how Paul himself was, was joyful in the midst of unreal difficulty and pain and I didn't know that the Lord was preparing me for what I was about to face and I know that many of you in this past year it's been difficult for you this church has had pains difficulties loss and I hope that today I can help you to to see the joy that we can have even in the midst of difficulty of pain strife and uh, I hope that we can continue on uh, for several weeks to find uh, true joy. We'll be in Philippians 1 today, so you may go ahead and turn there. I want to kind of set the stage for you. Uh, for one, everyone needs joy. Now, we may not know it, but we're all searching for it. We may not call it that. In fact, maybe we don't even know the definition to joy. And so I did like any good millennial I'm like right there on the millennial line and so I pulled out my phone and I just said Siri define joy so uh, this is how Siri defines it it's a feeling of great pleasure and happiness see Siri doesn't even know what joy is because happiness is how the world would describe joy but really we know that Things aren't always happy. Pleasure isn't always found. But joy can be had despite what, whatever we're going through, whatever difficulties we may find that we may come in contact with. And everyone needs joy, peace, fulfillment. But few find it. We struggle and struggle and struggle to find contentment, peace, fulfillment. 
and few find it. But Paul, so I want to share with you what Paul kind of went through. But before we get there, I just want to, I think it would be helpful to us to, to, to describe what joy isn't. One, it's not mere pleasure and happiness, as Siri would define it. Joy is not when everything is perfect, though we, we strive for that. But you've probably lived long enough to realize that everything's not going to be perfect or it won't be perfect for very long if it is. Joy is not having everything that we want. Doesn't our society tell us that's what joy is? You'll be happy if you can just get this new toy, this new car, this new phone, this new house, this new thing. Look at those people over there. Look at what they have. If you had that, you would be content and, and happy and fulfilled but it's not that. Joy is not having everything we want. Joy is not just a good feeling. And lastly, joy is not optional. Joy is not optional. In fact, I love how John Piper describes Christian joy. He says, Christian joy is a good feeling in the soul produced by the Holy Spirit as he causes us to see the beauty of Christ in the Word and in the world. Christian joy is not optional. It is something we can find. Let me set this passage up, and it will take a moment. We're going to be looking, uh, you can look at this later. It's Acts uh, chapter, um, it's in Acts where it kind of describes Paul uh, and how he got to this point. And really, if you know anything about the book of Philippians, Paul is imprisoned at this moment. As he's penning this letter, he's in a jail cell. And it's not like uh, the county jail, right, where there's three hots and a cot, you know, and you can watch, you know, you, you have a lot of amenities to you. No, it's, a, imagine the movies that you see where there's a dungeon, and imagine the, the stenches and the smells and the pure misery and Paul not only was in this imprisonment, but he was chained uh, most of the time between two guards. And so uh, he couldn't do what he wanted. He wasn't free to have anything. He was allowed a few things, like a pen, paper, and someone there with him. We believe Luke was there at times and others as well. But how did he get here? Well, it all took place as he's trying to fulfill God's will, as he's trying to follow God's ways and do what God wanted him to do. And so Paul is, he wants to go to Rome. He wants to go to Rome and he wants to go share Jesus with the Romans. He himself is a Roman citizen. And he's trying to get there. But in the meantime, he's in Jerusalem. He's at the temple. He has some Gentile believers with him. He walks up, he's talking, conversing. You know those Pharisees, they're just trying to pin down something that's wrong. And they're like, wait a second, those are Gentiles. He's walking towards the temple. What is he doing? Is he about to take them into the place that only the Jews can go? We're about to get him. We're about to get Paul, finally. Well, they were able to go into the, the Gentile court, and that's where Paul was taking them. But there was a big misunderstanding. And, and Paul tried to speak up for himself and say that this was ha happening, but these Pharisees were persistent in saying, no, he's done wrong. He's, he, he's broken the law. He needs to be punished. And they really, really wanted him dead. So they didn't relent. They continued on, continued on, continued on. Let's get him. Let's get Paul. And in this moment, some of the Roman guards came, and they were going to punish him. They were going to flog him and punish him there. And he, he cried out and says, wait a second. Would you flog one of your own citizens? a citizen of Rome. And that spared him for a moment. He was able to be taken away from these Pharisees who were bent on finding him dead. And he was able to be taken, but from that moment on, he was in custody. He was imprisoned. He was even allowed to, be, to travel around in his imprisonment up until this point. Uh, he went... Um, on a journey in a boat, the ship was wrecked. They came upon an island, and, and on that island, a snake bit him, and 
he was able to survive. I tell you all this because he was just trying to do what God wanted him to do, and circumstance after circumstance after circumstance came into his life. He was imprisoned uh, wrongly. And he gets to this point where he's writing this letter to a group of people he had met years before. And he says, rejoice. Rejoice. He, he talks about, I rejoice in you. I rejoice in these things. How could this man, after all he's gone through, imprisoned, how could he say that? How could he rejoice? It just doesn't make sense. He, he, he was writing to this group of people that he loved dearly. He had met them years before. He was traveling, again, following God's wills, traveling with uh, a companion, uh, and he uh, was traveling along the way. He was trying to go to a place called Mysia, and as he comes, he's interrupted in a vision by a man saying, you must come to Macedonia. And so he changes courses. He goes to Macedonia. It's the furthest at this point anyone's been with the gospel. It's the first European country that the gospel's shared in. The gospel is shared. A church is formed in this place called Philippi. He meets his young protege, Timothy, at this point. He meets, meets uh, Timothy is, is kind of a no-no in their society. He's uh, half Jew, half Greek. His dad's a Greek, his mom's a Jew, and that was not heard of, but, but God used that. It seemed unreal that this ragtag group of Christians, this newly formed church, would be really this church that would end up funding Paul's ministry. This small church would end up sending him money so that he could do what God had called him to do. And they developed this relationship back and forth, back and forth over the years. And Paul is in this prison cell, coming to the end of his life, knowing it's probably inevitable that he'll die in jail, and he ultimately did. And he writes a letter about joy, about joy. You see, we all need joy. We all long for joy. We all look for it. Few of us find it, but Paul did. And so I want to point to you, point you to where he found it and where I believe that we can find joy as well. So would you read with me in Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 through 6, and if you're able to stand in the honor of reading God's word, would you, as we read these verses, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. You may be seated. I think we see in this passage that Paul found joy in two places. First, he found it in faithful friends. He found it in faithful friends. And we, too, can find joy in faithful friends. Not just faithful to us, but faithful to Jesus. People who have the same heartbeat, people who have the same desires, people who have, same, have the same mission to see Jesus' name exalted among the nations and Jesus lifted high and, and we can find those faithful friends, they'll encourage us, they'll help us to navigate the rough waters of life, to navigate the difficulties and the circumstances, and we can find those faithful friends. This is my hope as your pastor, in a similar way that Paul found faithful friends in a body 
of, of, of people, a body of, of Christians. I think me and my family will find faithful friends here. We've already felt the love. We've already felt the kindness. We've already felt the prayers. We've already seen the smiles and enjoyed meeting each and every one of you. But ultimately, if we're going to carry out this mission of Christ, and I don't mean me and my family, because that's not how it works. You don't, pastors aren't the only ones meant to do this. You know that. I'm not telling anything you don't know. But we're all meant to carry that out together. And if we're going to go into the, the darkness of the world, we need each other. We need faithful friends. We need people to lock arms with to say, hey, the world may be against us. The devil may be trying to attack us, but we will stand together. We will lock arms and say, we will serve the Lord faithfully together. And so I hope that you will become and that I will become to you a faithful friend, serving the Lord arm in arm together. Let's look at some of the things, the characteristics that Paul's friends have. One, uh, they were on his mind often, and he was grateful for that. He says in verse 3, I thank my God every time I remember you. They were always on his mind. He was thinking about them. He was concerned for them, thinking about them. And when he thought of them, he was grateful. He was thankful. And he would thank the Lord. Thank you for Timothy. Thank you for Lydia. Thank you for the church there in Macedonia in Philippi they were on his mind and he was grateful they were in his joyful prayers he says in verse 4 in all my prayers for all of you I always pray with joy why because he, he found joy in the fact that he knew no matter what happens to him in this jail cell no matter how he would go through all of this, he would have people who are praying for him, who are thinking about him, who cared for him, who are sending him things that he desired, who are sending money and serving uh, him and helping him to accomplish the mission God had for him. And so they were in his joyful prayers. They were his ministry partners. He says in verse 5, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. I'm thankful for you. I find joy in you. They were his partners in ministry. And I hope that as I listen to your heartbeat, as I learn who you are and what the desires the Lord has put in your heart and in your minds, that we will begin to love one another. And it once we love, I love you and you love me, we'll be able, I'll be able to lead and we'll be able to accomplish the Lord's mission arm in arm, a partnership, a ministry together as God has placed us, each one here for his purposes, for his honor and for his glory. We also see in verse 5 that they were relying on the gospel together. They were relying on the gospel message of Jesus Christ that Jesus Christ had come and died so that we could have a right relationship with him so that when we place our trust in him, we would have forgiveness of sin and eternal life and be able to live our life here fulfilled, but also in the life to come. That's the gospel. We all need it. We're all sinners in need of forgiveness, in need of salvation, in need of Jesus. What Paul is saying is saying, you are partners with me in the gospel. Not only the gospel over our lives, but in the gospel that will save the ones we're, we're going to, that will minister to the ones that are out there that don't know Jesus yet. And that's what we're partners to and for. And, and great job yesterday being present in the community, showing folks that we care, we, we love them, we love for them and their children to come to our VBS. 
we need to keep that up. We need to lock arms and be a light into the community, into Lafayette and into Walker County as we share the gospel of Jesus. And lastly, in verse 6, we see that his faithful friends were in the Lord's care and keeping. He says, I'm confident that the Lord is working in your life. That you're in his care, you're in his keeping. And that's mu that must be where we stay. So Paul first sees that we have, uh, he finds joy in his faithful friends. But secondly, he finds it in a faithful father. Looking a little bit more into verse 6, we see what Paul sees here. Not only does he find joy from those that he's gathered with, this church, this group of people that are locking arms in mission and ministry with him, but he also finds it in his faithful father, his God, his rock, his strength, his salvation. And you and I too find joy. No matter what the the wind and waves of life are. We have a God who can be our rock, who can be our stay, who can be our, uh, our strength, our fortress. As Tom sang a moment ago, the wind and waves know his name. He is God over all things. Even the circumstances in your life, he is stronger than, he is more powerful than. Whatever difficulties you've faced, whatever things that you've gone through that have found you despondent and despaired. Never fear because the Lord is stronger than those things. The Lord is more powerful than those things in your life. And we too often give them undue power that they don't have. Even the enemy, even his minions, feign at the sound of God's name. God is powerful the wind and the waves, the circumstances of life, know his name. And so we must run to this faithful father, this one who loves us so, who cares so deeply for you, and not just you in a general sense, but you personally. Whatever difficulty you're going through, whatever thing is in your life, the Lord cares. He knows, he hears. And he is a faithful father. He cares deeply for everything in your life, every nuance, every difficulty, whatever you face, the Lord wants you to walk away, not in despair, but in joy. The Lord wants you to find joy no matter what you're going through. Perhaps it's, it's, it's a health issue. Perhaps it's the news that a loved one or a friend got the bad news of cancer. Perhaps it's a child dying too soon. The Lord knows your concerns. and He is a faithful father. Paul knew that and he's encouraging this group of faithful friends to say, look to the Lord. Look to Jesus. Look to God Almighty because he cares for you. And he says it in this way in verse 6. Paul says these words, I'm confident. I'm confident of this. I am sure of this. I have no doubt. I know without a shadow of doubt that he who began the good work in you will fulfill it, complete it. He's faithful. He will bring it about. Because he cares, he loves you. And we can find joy in that. He's a rock to cling to, no matter what the difficulty, no matter what the difficulty is. Perhaps you're a student, and of course you're on uh, summer break, so we won't talk about school too much, but maybe your difficulty is just... Will I get the grades that I need to get into the college that I want? Will I be able to get the career that I want? The Lord cares about the details of your life. 
cares about the small details. Don't, don't fail to take your concerns to him. The work that he began in you, he will complete it. He cares. He loves you. And we can find joy in him no matter the circumstance. I think we see a few things about the Lord through this. I just want, can we just take for a moment, just a few moments, and just list some of the things that we can, that we can be confident in about the Lord? We can be confident in Jesus and his work, his completed work. We can be confident that what he started, he'll finish. We can trust the Lord. We can trust him. We don't have to fear. We don't have to worry. The Lord is trustworthy. We can trust in the fact that he's working in us. We can trust him today. I love this. this we can experience Jesus in us. We can experience Christ in us. He says, he who began a good work in you. The Lord loves you so much that his spirit lives in, it, in you to complete the work he said he'll do. He's with you no matter what. No matter the difficulty, the Lord is in you, with you, and we can experience him. As, as John Piper said, Christian joy is a good feeling in the soul produced by the Holy Spirit. And he causes us to see the beauty of Christ in the word and in the world. We can experience the Lord. I love the song that we sang first, and it just says, show me your glory, Lord. Show me who you are. We can experience that. What Isaiah was only able to see because the Lord covered him and he just saw the tail end of his glory, we can see fresh and anew. We can see the glory of Jesus because what Jesus accomplished on the cross and defeated by dying and raising again, we can see the glory of Jesus. We can know his faithfulness. We can know it not just cognitively, but experientially. We can know that he is faithful. And last, I think we see that we can have hope in his return. Paul says that he's faithful to carry it out to completion. Till the day of Christ Jesus. And so we have the hope that the Lord will return and bring it to full completion in our lives. He loves us that much that he's coming back for us to rescue us, to give us full life in him. Complete life. So who are your faithful friends? I'm sure you have them. I'm hoping they're here in this room, I imagine. Some of them are. You see, we need one another to carry one another's burdens. We need one another to encourage each, each other as we face the difficulties of life that will come. We need each other. I need you. And I mean that. I need you. My family, we need you. You may think that you need me. I need you as much, maybe more. We need one another. And you need each other. Look around for a moment. I hope that I can ask you to do something participatory, right? So just look to your left, to your right. You need those folks. You need them. You need faithful friends who love the Lord, who lock arms with you and help you no matter what life brings. Listen, I don't know where you are spiritually. I hope to learn that. It will take time, but I, I will learn. I don't know your struggles. I hope that I can help with the struggles that you have. But ultimately, God has brought you here as much as he's brought me. We look back at, at just the past year since uh, January and just saw the Lord orchestrating this whole thing. Uh, search team church committee can share with you those things as well and and they already have and we've seen those things too we know that the lord is has been working and bringing us here 
But as much as the Lord brought me here, he brought you here too. Maybe it was 40 years ago, maybe it was 70, maybe it was 3, maybe it was 10. Maybe it's your first day, like me. But the Lord brought you here for a reason. Because he knew that we're faithful friends here. And he knows that he is a God who is faithful to complete the work he starts. So the Lord bringing you here today is him working in you. And he's brought you here today. He's faithful. And he's faithful to complete his work. Here's my encouragement to you, and this is what I hope to do as your pastor each week. I hope to share with you from God's word, but I hope to challenge you to do something with it. Because we can come each week and hear his word and go out and live our life the same way before we came in here. But we can be challenged to put it into practice, put it into action. So I just want you to think about who, who are my faithful, who do I need to be a faithful friend to this week? Who do I need to check in on, maybe that's not here today, or hasn't been in a while? Who do I maybe need to make a phone call to, to encourage, to, to share with, to, to help them find joy? And this week, can you just take a moment, maybe each day, maybe, maybe three times, and just think about the faithfulness of our Lord? And just rest in that. Just rest in that. But I'm not, I think in a group, uh, this number, uh, this gathering today, there's probably, there's a good chance someone's here today and you don't yet know our faithful Father. I would love to have the opportunity to share with you today to walk you through what it means to have a faith and the gospel message of Jesus Christ to place your faith in him for salvation. And so I don't know what your concern is today. I don't know how the Lord is speaking to you. I trust that he is because it said, he says his word will not go out and return void. Maybe there's something that you need to do today to do business with the Lord. Our musicians are going to come and, and play now. And I'd like to offer an invitation to you Perhaps it's just to come and I'd love to pray with you. If there's something in your life that's causing you despair and you're seeking joy, can I help you? Can I pray for you? Perhaps you're here today and you want to place your faith in Jesus for salvation. Would, won't you come? Perhaps you just need to come forward or maybe where you're seating and just say, and just pray to the Lord, cry out to him and say, Lord, you are faithful. Help me to depend on you, Lord. I don't know what your particular thing is I don't know what the Lord is telling you particularly but I just pray that you would hear and listen and obey today so if the Lord is dealing you with you as we begin singing in just a moment after I pray would you just come forward and do business with the Lord let us pray Lord thank you for this opportunity Lord to hear your word to take a moment and glimpse what a great God you are what a faithful father. Lord, would you help us, Lord, to put our faith in you, to depend on you, Lord, today. I pray, Lord, you would work in this place this morning. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Take my life, lead me, Lord. Take my life. Take my life, teach me, Lord. Take my life, teach me, Lord. Make my life useful to Thee. Take my life, teach me, Lord. Take my life, teach me, Lord. Make my life useful. Here am I, 
sent